<clears throat> Part 2 on Watership Down. Chapter 18, Watership Down. What is now proved was once only imagined. William Blake, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. It was evening of the following day. The north-facing escarpment of Watership Down, in shadow since early morning, now caught the western sun for an hour before twilight. Three hundred feet the down rose vertically in a stretch of no more than six hundred, a precipitous wall, from the thin belt of trees at the foot to the ridge where the steep flattened out. The light, full and smooth, lay like a gold rind over the turf, the firs and yew bushes, the few wind-stunted thorn trees. From the ridge, the light seemed to cover all the slope below, drowsy and still. But down in the grass itself, between the bushes, in that thick forest trodden by the beetle, the spider and the hunting shrew, the moving light was like a wind that danced among them to set them scurrying and weaving. The red rays flickered in and out of the grass stems, flashing minutely on membranous wings, casting long shadows behind the thinnest of filamentary legs, breaking each patch of bare soil into a myriad of individual grains. The insects buzzed, whined, hummed, stridulated and droned as the air grew warmer in the sunset. Louder, yet calmer than they, among the trees sounded the yellowhammer, the linnet, and greenfinch. The larks went up, twittering in the scented air above the down. From the summit, the apparent immobility of the vast blue distance was broken here and there by wisps of smoke and tiny momentary flashes of glass. Far below lay the fields green with wheat, the flat pastures graced by horses, the darker greens of the woods. Goodbye. G goodbye. Momentary guest appearance by Charlotte. They too, like the hillside jungle, were tumultuous with evening, but from the remote height turned to stillness, their fierceness tempered by the air that lay between. At the foot of the turf cliff, Hazel and his companions were crouching under the low branches of two or three spindle trees. Since the previous morning, they had journeyed nearly three miles. Their luck had been good, for everyone who had left the warren was still alive. They had splashed through two brooks and wandered fearfully into the deep woodlands west of Eckenswell. They had rested in the straw of a starveal or lonely barn and woken to find themselves attacked by rats. Silver and Buckthorn, with Big Big helping them, had covered the retreat until, once all were together outside, they had taken to flight. Buckthorn had been bitten in the foreleg, and the wound, in the manner of a rat bite, was irritant and painful. Skirting a small lake, they had star stared to see a great grey fisher bird that stabbed and paddled in the sedge until a flight of wild duck had frightened them away with their clamour. They had crossed more than half a mile of open pasture without a trace of cover, expecting every moment some attack that did not come. They had heard the unnatural humming of a pylon in the summer air and had actually gone beneath it on Fiverr's assurance that it could do them no harm. Now they lay under the spindle trees and sniffed in weariness and doubt at the strange, bare country round them. Since leaving the warren of the snares, they had become warier, shrewder, a tenacious band who understood each other and worked together. There was no more quarreling. The truth about the warren had been a grim shock. They had come closer together, relying on and valuing each other's capacities. They knew now that it was on these and on nothing else that their lives depended, and they were not going to waste anything they possessed between them. In spite of Hazel's efforts beside the snare, there was not one of them who had not turned sick at heart to think that Bigwig was dead and wondered, like Blackberry, what would become of them now. Without Hazel, without Blackberry, Buckthorn and Pipkin, Bigwig would have died. Without himself he would have died, for which else of them all would not have stopped running after such punishment? There was no more questioning of Bigwig's strength, Fiverr's insight, Blackberry's wits, or Hazel's authority. When the rats came, Buckthorn and Silver had obeyed Bigwig and stood their ground. The rest had followed Hazel when he roused them and without explanation told them to go quickly outside the barn. 
Later, Hazel had said that there was nothing for it but to cross the open pasture, and under Silver's direction they had crossed it, with Dandelion running ahead to reconnoiter. When Fiverr said the iron tree was harmless, they believed him. Strawberry had had a bad time. His misery made him slow-witted and careless, and he was ashamed of the part he had played at the Warren. He was soft, and more use than he dared admit to indolence and good food. But he made no complaint, and it was plain that he was determined to show what he could do and not to be left behind. He had proved useful in the woodlands, being better accustomed to thick woods than any of the others. He'll be all right, you know, if we give him a chance, said Hazel to Bigwig by the lake. So he darn well ought to be, replied Bigwig, the great dandy. For by their standard, Strawberry was scrupulously clean and fastidious. Well, I won't have him browbeaten, Bigwig. Mind, that won't help him. This Bigwig had accepted, though rather sulkily. Yet he himself had become less overbearing. The snare had left him weak and overwrought. It was he who had given the alarm in the barn, for he could not sleep, and at the sound of scratching had started up at once. He would not let Silver and Buckthorn fight alone, but he had felt obligated to leave the worst of it to them. For the first time in his life, Bigwig had found himself driven to moderation and prudence. As the sun sank lower and touched the edge of the cloud belt on the horizon, Hazel came out from under the branches and looked carefully round the lower slope. Then he stared upward over the anthills to the open down rising above. Fiver, Fiver and Acorn followed him out and fell to nibbling at a patch of sainfoin. It was new to them, but they did not need to be told that it was good, and it raised their spirits. Hazel turned back and joined them among the big, rosy-veined magenta flower spikes. Fiver, he said, let me get this right. You want us to climb up this place, however far it is, and find shelter on the top. Is that it? Yes, Hazel. But the top must be very high. I can't even see it from here. It'll be open and cold. Not in the ground, and the soil's so light that we shall be able to scratch some shelter easily when we find the right place. Hazel considered again. It's getting started that bothers me. Here we are, all tired out. I'm sure it's dangerous to stay here. We've nowhere to run to. We don't know the country, and we can't get underground. But it seems out of the question for everybody to climb up there tonight. We should be even less safe. We shall be forced to dig, shan't we, said Acorn. This place is almost as open as that heather we crossed, and the trees won't hide us from anything hunting on four feet. It would have been the same any time we came, said Fiver. I'm not saying anything against it, Fiver, replied Acorn, but we need holes. It's a bad place not to be able to get underground. Before everyone goes up to the top, said Hazel, we ought to find out what it's like. I'm going up myself to have a look round. I'll be as quick as I can, and you'll have to hope for the best until I get back. You can rest and feed anyway. You're not going alone, said Fiverr firmly. Since each one of them was ready to go with him in spite of their fatigue, Hazel gave in and chose Dandelion and Hawkbit, who seemed less weary than the others. They sat out up the hillside, going slowly, picking their way from one bush and tussock to another, and pausing continually to sniff and stare along the great expanse of grass, which stretched on either side as far as they could see. A man walks upright. For him, it is strenuous to climb a steep hill because he has to keep pushing his own vertical mass upward and cannot gain any momentum. The rabbit is better off. His forelegs support his horizontal body and the great back legs do the work. They are more than equal to thrusting uphill the light mass in front of them. Rabbits can go fast uphill. In fact, they have so much power behind that they find going downhill awkward, and sometimes, in flight down a steep place, they may actually go head over heels. On the other hand, the man is five or six feet above the hillside and can see all around. To him, the ground may be steep and rough, but on the whole it is even, and he can pick his direction easily from the top of his moving six-foot tower. The rabbit's anxieties and strain in climbing the down were different, therefore, from those which you, reader, will experience if you go there. Or even any readers who might be female. I do like this book, but it's um, very old-fashioned. <clears throat> Their main trouble was not bodily fatigue. When Hazel had said that they were all tired out, he had meant that they were feeling the strain of prolonged insecurity and fear. 
Rabbits above ground, unless they are in proved familiar surroundings close to their holes, live in continual fear. If it grows intense enough, they can become glazed and paralyzed by it. Thorn, to use their own word. Hazel and his companions had been on the jump for nearly two days. Indeed, ever since they had left their home warren in five days before, they had faced one danger after another. They were all on edge, sometimes starting at nothing, and again lying down in any patch of long grass that offered. Bigwig and Buckthorn smelled of blood, and everyone else knew they did. What bothered Hazel, Dandelion, and Hawkbit was the openness and strangeness of the down, and their inability to see very far ahead. They climbed not over, but through the sun-red grass, among the awakened insect movement and the light ablaze. The grass undulated about them. They peered over anthills and looked cautiously round clumps of teasel. They could not tell how far away the ridge might be. They topped each short slope, only to find another above it. To Hazel, it seemed a likely place for a weasel, or the white owl, perhaps, might fly along the escarpment at twilight, looking inward with its stony eyes, ready to turn a few feet sideways and pick off the shelf anything that moved. Some Ilil wait for their prey, but the white owl is a seeker, and he comes in silence. As Hazel still went up, the south wind began to blow and the June sunset reddened the sky to the zenith. Hazel, like nearly all wild animals, was unaccustomed to look up at the sky. What he thought of as the sky was the horizon, usually broken by trees and hedge. Now, with his head pointing upward, he found himself gazing at the ridge as over the skyline came the silent, moving, red-tinged cumuli. Their movement was disturbing. Unlike that of trees or grass or rabbits, these great masses moved steadily, noiselessly, and always in the same direction. They were not of his world. Oh, Frith, thought Hazel, turning his head for a moment to the bright glow in the west. Are you sending us to live among the clouds? If you spoke truly to Fiverr, help me to trust him. At this moment he saw Dandelion, who had run well ahead, squatting on an anthill clear against the sky. Alarmed, he dashed forward. Dandelion, get down, he said. Why are you sitting up there? Because I can see, replied Dandelion with a kind of excited joy. Come and look. You can see the whole world. Hazel came up to him. There was another ant hill nearby, and he copied Dandelion, sitting upright on his hind legs and looking about him. He realized now that they were almost on level ground. Indeed, the slope was no more than gentle for some way back along, along the line by which they had come, but he had been preoccupied with the idea of danger in the open and had not noticed the change. They were on top of the down. Perched above the grass, they could see far in every direction. Their surroundings were empty. If anything had been moving, they would have seen it immediately, and where the turf ended, the sky began. A man, a fox... Even a rabbit coming over the down would be conspicuous. Fiverr had been right. Up here they would have clear warning of any approach. The wind ruffled their fur and tugged at the grass, which smelled of time and self-heal. The solitude seemed like a release and a blessing. The height, the sky, and the distance went to their heads, and they skipped in the sunset. Oh, Frith on the hills, cried Dandelion. He must have made it for us. He may have made it, but Fiverr thought of it for us, answered Hazel. Wait till we get him up here. fiverr -a. Where's Hawkbit? said Dandelion suddenly. Although the light was still clear, Hawkbit was not to be seen anywhere on the upland. After staring about for some time, they ran across to a little mound some way away and looked again. But they saw nothing except a field mouse, which came out of its hole and began furricking in a path of seeded grass. He must have gone down, said Dandelion. Well, whether he has or not, said Hazel, we can't go on looking for him. The others are waiting and they may be in danger. We must go down ourselves. What a shame to lose him, though, said Dandelion, just when we'd reached Fiverr's Hills without losing anyone. He's such a duffer, we shouldn't have brought him up. But how could anything have got hold of him here without our seeing? No, he's gone back for sure said Hazel. I wonder what Bigwig will say to him. I hope he won't bite him again. We'd better get on. Are you going to bring them up tonight? asked Dandelion. I don't know, said Hazel. It's a problem. Where's the shelter to, to be found? 
they made for the steep edge. The light was beginning to fail. They picked their direction by a clump of stunted trees which they had passed on their way up. These formed a kind of dry oasis, a little feature common on the downs. Half a dozen thorns and two or three elders grew together above and below a bank. Between them the ground was bare, and the naked chalk showed a pallid, dirty white under the cream-colored elder bloom. As they approached, they suddenly saw Hawkbit sitting among the thorn trunks, cleaning his face with his paws. "'We've been looking for you,' said Hazel. "'Where in the world have you been?' "'I'm sorry, Hazel,' replied Hawkbit meekly. "'I've been looking at these holes. I thought they might be some good to us.' In the low bank behind him were three rabbit holes. There were two more flapped on the ground between the thick, gnarled roots. They could see no footmarks and no droppings. The holes were clearly deserted. Have you been down? asked Hazel, sniffing round. Yes, I have, said Hawkbit. Three of them, anyway. They're shallow and rather rough, but there's no smell of death or disease, and they're perfectly sound. I thought they might do for us, just for the moment, anyway. In the twilight, a swift flew screaming overhead, and Hazel turned to Dandelion. News! News! he said. Go and get them up here. Thus it fell to one of the rank and file to make a lucky find that brought them at last to the downs, and probably saved a life or two, for they could hardly have spent the night in the open, either on or under the hill, without being attacked by some enemy or another.